Welcome back to the Scottabyte channel and this is Scott. So over the last couple of days I've received messages from subscribers saying that well whenever they run Docker applications they always seem to have problems. And so I, that prompted me really to take a look at an idea of how to run Docker applications more easily. And so many people do find Docker kind of complicated. And really, when it comes down to it, it shouldn't be. It's got some pretty basic components. And we're going to go over those. And we're also going to do a couple of demonstrations to hopefully sort things out. So Docker is application virtualization. That's opposed to a virtual machine that virtualizes the hardware, it virtualizes the operating system, and it virtualizes the application. And then there are LexD containers that I talk about on the channel all the time, and they virtualize the operating system and the application, and they use a shared kernel of the host. So Docker is simply application virtualization alone, and therefore it's very lean and efficient. So Docker components to know are stacks, containers, images, volumes, and networks. And we're gonna look at all of those here briefly. So Docker stacks are data structures that sit above containers and manage the orchestration of multiple containers. An application can have one or more containers. A Docker container may contain multiple Docker images, which are files used to build a Docker container. Volumes are the place where non-volatile data is stored. And Docker networks allow containers and stacks to communicate with each other in a private NAT or exposed to your main LAN. So how exactly does Docker work? Well, application stacks and containers are read-only and do not keep any persistent data after the Docker application is terminated. So if your Docker application does not use volumes, it loses all the data, and when you run it the next time, it won't remember anything from the previous run. So Docker volumes are either external disk structures and or folder mappings where all persistent non-volatile data is stored. And without a volume, a Docker application will not store any data between runs. So by default, Docker containers run on an internal NAT network and they don't share any data with your LAN. To expose data to your LAN, the Docker application must use an expose directive and your Docker run or Docker compose command must designate which ports on the Docker host to map those exposed ports to. So how to execute a Docker application? So Docker applications pull images from a Docker repository when you run them. A pull command looks for updated copies of images and downloads them. The Docker run and Docker compose commands are ways to run a Docker application. Docker Compose is a GitHub application that adds a lot of functionality to Docker Run, including a stack with multiple containers, and many people refer to the Docker Compose command as a developer command, but it's come into popular use because it's an easy way to specify parameters and get an application up and running with a template. And we're going to look at a little bit of that as well. So when a Docker image is updated, old Docker images are not automatically deleted from your system. We are going to look at some examples of Docker run and Docker compose commands and some general Docker commands. So here we are at the command prompt for a test machine. And the first thing that we have to do is to install Docker if Docker isn't installed. Once we install Docker, we're going to refer to this machine as the Docker host. So this command that you see right here is a command that you can get from the Docker homepage and it tells you exactly how to install Docker. 
I might also point out that it is possible to install Docker from a snap file if you're on Ubuntu with the sudo apt install snap, but I don't really recommend that because the sudo apt install snap command does not do certain things that you have to go configure later on, and it's much more effective to install um, Docker from the curl script that we're doing right now. Okay, so now Docker is installed, and this only installed Docker, but we also want to install Docker Compose, and we do that with the sudo apt install docker dash compose, and I say yes, and it goes ahead and installs that. So one of the things that we want to do to make Docker a little bit easier to use is we want to go ahead and add the Docker group to the groups that your user account is authorized to. If you type the groups command, let's clear the screen here. If we type the groups command, you can see that I'm only in the uh, my own group, Scott group, and the pseudo group. So in order to put myself in the Docker group, I want to do a sudo user mod dash a capital G docker dollar sign user, which will put me in the Docker group. If I do new group Docker, it's effectively the same as logging off and logging back in again. And if I do groups, you can see that I'm now in the Docker group. So what that allows me to do is it allows me to issue Docker commands such as docker ps without using the sudo command and that's very handy. So let's look at a docker application for the Joplin notes server. So basically this is the docker hub page for Joplin server and you can see it's a pretty new application. It was updated 18 days ago. And so as an example here, here is my Joplin desktop application. Um, this is a lot like Evernote. Uh, you can create notes and you can have different topics and titles. And this is how I store my personal notes and notes for shows when I get ready to update things. So what the Joplin server does is it synchronizes those notes from desktop clients, tablets, phones, and so on back to the Joplin server. So this is a very simple um, application. Usually if you scroll down on the Docker Hub page, they will give you an example of uh, the Docker run command to install this application. So let's go here and look at what it will take to install that particular application. And the easiest way to install it is going to be with a Docker run command and that's the docker run command. So it's docker run, and it's pointing to an environment variable file called .env, and that's where it expects to find your environment variables, and then it's using port 22300 to communicate and do its um, uh, configuration, uh, its web page, and so on. So the second number here that's listed is always the is always the port number that the application uses inside of the application or on the docker network the port here to the left side is a port that you can change because you don't want to change the port inside the container because that's what the programmer used but you can change the port outside to be any other port you might want to use if you've adjusted the application to uh, compensate for that in some cases. So uh, this says that port 22300 would be exposed to my Docker host and that's how it would run. So it's going to go over here and it's going to download and run that application. So let's hit enter and it says that there's no file or directory for the env file. So that's kind of interesting. We're going to have to go create a, uh, a folder for that or a file for that. So let's just say touch.env 
and that will create a file called .env. So let's go to our, try our docker run command once again. Let's see what happens. So now it says unable to find image. It's downloading the image and it's doing the pulls as you can see and it's extracting the file and then the last thing that it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and build the container. So you can see there's quite a few images. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight images that comprise this one particular container. And we're executing those with that single docker run command. Now due to the magic of video and now that this is all completed, uh, you can see the docker run command. It finished all the pulls. And then we start to see some log files coming out to the console here. And it's saying when everything is taking place and how it's taking place. And it comes down here to the end and it says uh, maintenance completed in 0.31 milliseconds. So we haven't gotten a prompt back. And the reason we didn't get a prompt back is because we didn't set this image to actually run in what we call detached mode. But let's go see what this actually did. So when going to my web browser and going to 172.16.1.148, which is the address of the Docker host that I loaded on, and colon port 22300, you can see that it says invalid origin. And the reason is, is that the Joplin server is expecting to come from my domain but I didn't put anything in the ENV file indicating a domain. But this lets you know that it actually got to the application correctly. So if we go back here and we do a control C at the prompt to get our prompt back, and then we go back into our application and we reload, you see it says this site cannot be reached. And the reason for that is because we really wanted to do a Docker run like it said on the web page, but we want to put a dash D in here to detach the image. And when I add that dash D and it runs, it will give me the prompt back after it creates, meaning that the application will be up and running and we'll be able to log out and not have to continue to sit here and wait for the application. Now that the image is running detached from our terminal session, we can do a Docker PS, which will show us that the image is running and it will give us the container ID of the image, which can be used to start and stop it. We can also use a PS-A, which will show all containers on the host, whether they're running or not. And you can see that apparently it also started a, another container in the background and that was probably used um, just to bring the thing up originally, but it's a different container. So we have a container that ends with 989, and then we have this container here that ends in 177A, and this one's not exactly started. The other interesting command that we can do is a listing of the images. So we can do a Docker... Um, images and it says there's the one image out there so we can stop a docker image by doing a docker ps to find out what the image is and we can use its container id here so we'll copy this and we'll do a docker stop on that image number and it will stop the application you know that it worked if it responds with the container ID once again. And now if we do a Docker PS, you will see it returns nothing. If we do a PS-A, it lists the two container IDs that are out there, but neither one of them is currently running. So I moved over to my production Joplin server to illustrate a point. So first of all, if I do a Docker PS, you can see that my Joplin server actually has two 
uh, containers inside of it. One container is for the Postgres database, and we'll get into that here in just a little bit. And then my other container is for the actual Joplin server application. So now that I have these two containers in here, um, you generally don't have any problem with legacy containers that if you do a PS-A and you perform updates of containers, you generally end up purging the old containers. But what you don't end up purging sometimes are the old images associated with the containers. So as an example of that, if I was to do a Docker uh, images, you would see that I have uh, the latest for the Postgres, the latest for the Joplin server, and then I have a couple of others for previous versions of Postgres and a previous version of the Joplin server. And you can see that these three are clearly not being used because um, I know that the latest images are the ones actually being used. And so there's uh, 377 megabytes in an image file and another 377 megabytes in an image file and 1.24 gigabytes in an image file. So one of the things you can do to clean that up is we can issue a docker rmi command and this docker rmi command will say uh, go ahead and list all the docker images with the docker images dash q which really just contains the uh, container or the rather the image id and then i do an rmi which removes all those images now the thing about it is it won't remove a running image so we'll be safe because the running image of Postgres and the running image of Joplin server will be just fine when we execute this command. So it should come back and delete three containers or three images. And so no telling how many underlying uh, parts of those images exist. So you can see that it's actually deleting quite a few. And then it should give us an error message um, for the ones that it's unable to delete here shortly. And there we are, the two error messages that we got from the, from the images it was unable to delete. So if we do a Docker images, we're only left with the two latest that are running. And this is one good way to clean up your Docker host from images that are no longer being used. So here I've reset my server again, and Docker PS doesn't list anything. Docker PS-A doesn't list anything and Docker images doesn't list anything because everything's back to where we started with a fresh Docker install. So at this point in time, I want to look at Docker Compose. So I'm going to do a nano docker-compose.yml or yaml if you like. You can use either one. And so it brings up the nano editor and I'm going to paste in my Docker compose file. The reason I selected the application for Joplin server is because it has two services or really two containers inside of it. One of them is a database and one of them is an app container. So there will be two containers as we noticed in the last screenshots. Um, so here, uh, this version number, generally your version number is 2 dot something or 3 dot something. And it kind of depends on the version of YAML code that the author used when they developed their application. And so you can generally find samples of YAML files or you can try to build one on your own. So briefly, looking at the database, we have an image here that's going to be Postgres and it says go get the latest Postgres database, so the latest Postgres database. And then volumes are dot data forward slash Postgres, and now what that means is that means that on my Docker host, it will have a, um, it will create a subdirectory called slash data, where we run this application from, and inside that it'll create a Postgres subdirectory 
And then that points to inside the container slash var slash lib slash postgres uh, ql forward slash data. So you can't change what's to the right of the colon, but you can to the left. Same thing goes with the ports. It's using port 5432, and it's exposing that to 5432 on the host, and that's what the database is using. I have a restart unless stopped, which basically is self-explanatory. In case of an error, it will restart itself. I give a Postgres password here, and then I have a user of Joplin user and a database user of Joplin DB, which are duplicated in the section below for the app because the app has to know about the credentials. So you'd always want to, if you found this as a template, you'd always want to change these. And I just typed in something random here to use. So here's an app, another app, the second app, which is the image for the Joplin image. And it says it depends on the database. So it's going to say basically wait till the database container is up and running before you run this container. In other words, Joplin server needs its database before it can start. And then just like we saw in the Docker run command, it uses ports 22,300 internally and also externally. And then it says uh, down here, uh, there are some environment variables. You remember the .env file and the Docker run? Well, the Docker compose file has an environment section and you can type in all the variables that you need for the application in that environment section without having to create an external environment file, or you could create an external environment, environment file either way. But this is really nice to be able to keep all the data in one particular place. So I match the password from above. I match the database and the Postgres user from above. And then I put some things in like I'm going to use smtp.gmail.com for my email. And it's going to be port 587. Uh, and it's going to be secure mail. And uh, it's pointing to my email address and then some password. And then uh, it's, it's going to say the no reply name for email is Joplin server. And it sends it to no reply at scottabyte.com, which is basically the reply bit bucket. So let's save this thing off. So how do you run a Docker compose file? Well, you can say docker dash compose space up dash D and that'll start it detached like we looked at before. Or if you just say slash up, you'll be able to see all the log information. So let's just do the, the space up without the detach first off and we'll watch it download all of the container components. We have a few more container, container components than we had from the Docker run command, mainly because we're bringing down the Postgres database also on our server. And so it's bringing this thing up completely here. And the first one was Postgres. The second one was the Joplin server. It's bringing up all the pieces and it's going off and running what it needs to do. And now it's creating the database container from those images and it's creating the application from those images. And so now that the application is up and running, the next thing I'm going to do is go off to my web page and I've set up an Nginx reverse proxy manager entry for this application at the address and I've called it testing.scottabyte.com. And when I go to testing.scottabyte.com, it brings up my Joplin server. Now, if we come down here again, as a reminder, if we do a control C, it's going to stop the application and come back to the prompt. So if I come back up here again and refresh the web page, it says bad gateway because it doesn't know how to get to it because the application's down. But if I bring back Docker Compose, space up and I do dash D to detach the image this time. It gives me the prompt back. I can see that it's up and running by doing a Docker PS and there's the Joplin server image up and running and the Postgres image up and running. And now if I go back to the web server and repaint again, it will enter the application successfully.
So now that my application is up and running, I can do a Docker PS as we saw before. This I can do one of the hand, handy things actually in having the Docker compose file is I can shut the application down with the Docker compose command because if I had to use Docker stop, I'd have to say first Docker stop with this container ID and then Docker stop with this container ID. But instead, I can do a Docker dash compose space down and it will shut down both containers and that's all there is to it. And of course, when you shut the container down, it removes it from the running containers. And if I do a Docker compose, uh, rather if I do a Docker PS, you'll see that there isn't anything there. A PS-A, there also isn't anything there because one of the things that Docker compose down command does is to remove the container. However, if I do a Docker images command, you can see my images are still out there. And if I did a docker compose up command dash D, it would simply reload that configuration. It would not have to re-download the images because they're already on the local system and the application is up and running pretty quickly. So it started the database and now it's waiting to start the application. And once the database comes online, the application will go ahead and start. And once we see it done here, we should be able to connect to it again. Okay, so if we go back to here and we repaint the screen, you can see that the application is still up and running just fine. So now that you know what images, containers, and volumes are, remember that volumes store your non-volatile data, the other thing that we want to look at is we want to look at Docker networks. So there's a command called docker network ls. And when you install Docker on your machine, you're going to get three networks. You're going to get the network called none, which is literally no network. You're going to get the network called host, and that is the uh, Docker host network. And then you're going to get the network called bridge, which is the most commonly used network because that's the one that lets you bridge your applications and port numbers out to the Docker host and therefore to the network. You can also create other Docker networks. And on my channel, I have some uh, instructions on some other videos that explain how to create Docker networks for VLANs. So now that we've covered that, the only other thing that we have is Docker um, is really Docker stacks. So Docker stacks are really related to clusters. So Docker can have multiple Docker hosts that run and those Docker hosts can exchange data or they can actually run applications. And if one node goes down, it can migrate to the other node and that sort of thing. So we're not really gonna get into uh, Docker clusters per se. But on our Docker host, we can create a Docker cluster with the command docker swarm init. And then in this case, since I have more than one um, IP address on my host, I want the advertised address of this cluster node to be 172.16.1.148. And when I do that docker init command, it says in order to add a worker node to this swarm, uh, do this and it gives you a particular token so that tells you how you can create another docker node and have it join this particular swarm and then you can also add another manager node by default the docker swarm init makes your first node a management node and so you can have more than one management node in your cluster if you so desire but once you have a cluster then instead of doing the uh, docker compose command, you do a docker stack deploy command, but you point to the same docker compose file that we used before. And then I simply give my swarm a name and my name is going to be Joplin. And this will go ahead and deploy this thing if it actually exists. But I forgot that I initted this thing before. So we have to go back and get a copy of my docker compose file. Um, that I had in the 
in my notes. So let's do a nano of docker dash compose dot yml. Let's see, let's make it yaml because that's what I made it up here in this other command. And let's paste everything into it. And we don't need to go over this again because it's the same command that I did from last time. And now we do a docker stack deploy on that file. And in this particular case, it started it up and it says unsupported options restart. And OK, that's fine. But now that we've performed a docker stack deploy, if we do a docker ps or a docker ps-a, you notice that it does list what we have running here in the docker ps-a. But the proper way to do it when you're dealing with a Docker swarm or a Docker cluster is a Docker stack ls. And then to see the services that are running in our Docker swarm, then we're going to do a Docker stack services. And then I'm going to list the name of my swarm. And so there it is listed. And it says that there's zero of one replicas. A replica is that you can say when you start a service, you can say that you want three or four of them running on this node for node balancing. And then on another node, you can describe how many you want running out there and all of that. So we don't want to get too deeply into clustering or Docker swarms, but I thought I would just whet your appetite and let you know that the Docker stack is another um, managing system that falls above containers uh, for container orchestration. In summary, Docker containers are virtual applications that are created from Docker images. The Docker run, Docker compose, and Docker stack deploy commands are used to pull images from the Docker hub, create containers, and manage them. Docker Compose and Docker Stack Deploy require a properly formatted YAML file in order to execute. And most errors with deploying Docker applications are spacing and formatting errors in the YAML file or incorrectly mapped ports. Anyway, that's it for today. Please subscribe and like to the channel. And don't forget to hit that notification bell and we'll see you next time.